Wordsmiths is brought to you by Ole Arts, the South Sound's premier arts and culture magazine. So, you've written a book, you found a publisher, or you've taken matters into your own hands, and now you've reached the final stage, getting that book onto a shelf, a bookstore shelf. Well, first off, can I just say congratulations? You've literally come so far. You know, we've looked at how writer groups and organizations help develop their communities with Creative Colloquy, and how independent publishers and authors can help further this work with Forest Avenue Press. Now, in the previous episode, we briefly touched upon Bookstore's role in all of this, but for this last episode of Wordsmiths, I wanted to go a bit deeper. So. My handy cameraman, Keith, and I went to Browser's Bookshop one more time, and we talked to the owner, Andrea Griffith, about how she's helping her community with her bookshop. Hello, I'm here with Andrea Griffith, the owner of Browser's, and we, right now, are in the kids section. Andrea, thank you for being here with me today. Thank you for having me. So, I have some questions. I super duper love your bookstore. Um, we filmed Laura Stanfield here last time, and I'm just wondering, like, what is the history of this bookstore? Browser started in 1928 in Aberdeen by Anna Blom, and she was advised to move the bookstore to downtown Olympia in 1935 because even then Aberdeen couldn't quite support a local bookstore and so it she moved it in 1935 um, to the space where Dree's Home Furnishings is in now on Washington Street and then in the 70s it moved to this location which it used to be a the 107 Tavern and it was quite a wild type of tavern apparently there was a big famous drug bust here in 1969 um, that's kind of interesting to to look at articles from that time but by then it had changed hands um, to another woman named Eileen and then in the mid 70s it um, it was bought by another woman named Jennifer um, I bought the store from Jennifer um, in October of 2014 and so I'm actually the fourth female owner of the store. It's only been owned by women and it's just a really cool legacy, but it's been in this location since the mid seventies. And um, this block has changed a lot and the historical society has sent me tons of pictures of the storefront and what it used to be as a, a tavern and, and then now. Um, and so it's, it's, it's the building itself it has a really interesting history. So. so wait, does the Historical Society, do they just like email you? you yeah. It's like, oh, we found this thing. That's, so, that's the beauty of Olympia. Like you meet a guy <laughs> at the park and then all of a sudden you realize he's like the archivist for the state and he's sending you pictures. You know, like that's just, that's, the, that's how things work in Olympia, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, you know? So I am the fourth female owner and um, we were able to buy the building in October of 2014 as well as the store. Mm -hmm. And so that puts us in a, a really good, unique position of we are the landlord, so we'll never raise our rent. I feel like that's that's how an independent bookstore can manage to stay in business in, in, in this time. Do you know why it was like originally called Browsers? It was called Anna, Blum, Anna Blom's Books in in you know 1935 to maybe the 70s and then when she sold the store to Eileen it made sense to change the the name of the store and so that that's when it was changed to browsers and I'm not really sure why hmm. so um I was a medical librarian um, my entire career and but we I always worked at big academic libraries and we moved to Olympia and I got a job up at St. Peter as their hospital librarian and so I managed that library for a couple of years but it just wasn't a good long-term fit for me and and so I was working from home one day and I just cold called Jennifer at the store and just said have you ever thought about selling your bookstore and she said well Andrea maybe we should go out to coffee and so we did and like one thing led to 
the next, I mean, and within just a couple of months that we had bought the store and you know, every accountant said, run, go, do not do this. Every, you know, advice we got from almost everyone was like, you were crazy. Um, just but the market for independent bookstores, um, and in this one in particular, they were just like, this is too big of a risk, but we went ahead and did it. And the whole thing, the transition was very collegial. She stayed on for a few months and showed me how she'd done things. And then, and then she moved on and then it was just me and, and the staff. And it's, it's, it's been just such an amazing thing to learn so much in just a couple of years. You know, it's just like every day I learned so much, so. So what were some of the first changes that you made to browsers after you acquired it? Some of the first things I did was just try to make the store more aesthetically pleasing and also the, the start of adding some new books in. And I, when you when you have an all used bookstore, it can go it, it can look like a yard sale really, really fast. And so I I just I spent a lot of time adding some just a few new books in as we could afford it but then also just trying to arrange things a little more aesthetically pleasing. And then about maybe four to six months after we bought the store, then we, the store had pink carpet. Um, and so we had to move every single shelf, every single book out of the whole front area. And we laid down hardwood floors and, you know, ripped up the carpet first and laid down floors. And that actually changed everything um, for us. Honestly, people who had suffered from allergies or suffer from allergies, they could not come into the store because the carpet just got wet and dried, wet and dried, and, and people couldn't come in. And so that that changed like the feeling of the place to, to have all hardwood. And we did that in the back area too. Um, and one of the other things that we really did do that made a huge difference um, just within maybe a month of buying the store is we painted the the front um, navy blue and then we added our logo onto the, the brick face. And that just, people who had never known this was a bookstore, they've gone down Capitol Way for many years and just didn't even see what the store really was. And all of a sudden they were stopping and coming in because it looked like a bookstore. And so that was just like one not very expensive thing that we did that made a big difference. So how do you choose what books you add to your stock? Well, we are a mix of new and used. And so used books, it's kind of whatever people bring in through the door, but we're very picky. And so we're always looking at condition and does it fit with what we think people will actually buy. And so that's pretty highly curated at this point. Um, but with new books, it's a totally different thing. It's almost like we're running two different businesses in here, even though it looks just like a whole bunch of books. Um, new books are a little trickier. We order them as we can afford them, which so far we've been able to order. We went from 0% new books to, and we're getting close to 40% new with the thought that it would get up to between 50 and 60% new. And so we look at what sells, um, what's popular, but also what's interesting, what people in Olympia read. So we really try to tailor our, our stock and our collection. I'm a librarian, so I use the word collection instead of inventory, which is kind of weird, but we, we, we view our collection as um, it should really reflect the community at large. And so we really pay attention to what's being published, but also what is interesting in every area. Can people bring their used books in for store credit? Absolutely. We, we don't have any set buying hours. And so it's any time that we're open, people can bring in used books. If you have more than, you know, six boxes, we like a heads up. But we, we do this every day. Um, some of our criteria that we use, and it sounds kind of smart alecky, but it's, can we sell this book? You know, so it has to be in good condition and it has to be something that people still read or it has to be valuable. So those are kind of the three main things we're looking at. So I know you have a few events here every month. How do you choose which events you host? We have kind of a whole bunch of things that we, we do. We have everything from children's events to um, local authors that we have offsite events for, but we sell the books. 
Um, we also sell the books for the Washington Center events. So Sarah Val was here um, last year and we sold the books for that. Um, and then we, we do have an event space that we're bringing in more and more local authors. And up until, so that space has only really been done for about a year. And so up until now, I've just said yes to people. So they approached me like, hey, I'm going to Portland this state and Seattle this state. Could we stop in Olympia and have an event at your store? And I have always just said yes. But the, the last few months are the first time that I have actually try to shape the events a little bit more and go out and ask different authors to come. And so far I've been really pleased with the results. We also have a um, store book club that is quite vibrant and, um, and diverse. It's not just women of a certain age getting around talking about a book. There's men that come. There's, there's people as young as 18 and as old as 80 that attend this book club regularly. The other, one of the other things that we do that's been really fun is every quarter or season we have a cookbook club and so we pick either um, a cookbook author or one particular cookbook and everyone brings recipes out of that body of work or that particular cookbook and and honestly the some of the cookbook clubs that we've had it's it's better than like Thanksgiving dinner. It's just ridiculously good and we just like talk about food and it's it's really fun and it creates community around the store um, that has just been interesting to see the uh, like the the ripple effects of that um, going forward. How else do independent bookstores support the local community? Well sometimes it's just as simple as having a table in a children's section where families can come and sit down and read together. Um, another way that we support the local communities, we do the book sales for the library events. And I'm also involved, um, the, the store is really involved with the South Sound Reading Foundation, which is an excellent organization here in um, Thurston County that works in Mason and Lewis counties too, but just providing physical books to school children and they just do excellent work. And so we're a sponsor of theirs as well. So why might independent bookstores be like more of an asset to local authors than, you know, commercial sellers? Well, for me, it's all about context. We can put a, a book that may not get any attention in an online environment, but if you put a book next to another book that tells some sort of a story, um, it, it jumps out at, at customers. We're also really good at hand selling books. If, if a bookseller, a real live bookseller believes in your book and has read it and is passionate about it, we can sell it. And that is why you would re local authors should really consider making good ties with their their local bookstore because we really do sell books. So I know you have a local section mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are consignments. Yes. So we really do try to support even self-published authors that are local. We we don't give any money out for the consigned books until they sell but we offer six months of having um, the book in our store and we try to give it some face out time um, and we try to sell it for the, the local author that has chosen to go through the self-published route. So how has the community responded to browsers? Olympia has been incredibly supportive of the changes that we've done at the store and just the store in general. Um, I think people in Olympia really do get that if you want a vibrant downtown you have to spend money downtown and it's a testament to Olympia that there are three bookstores in just the downtown area and we're all doing fine or well and well enough to be here still you know and and I just I feel really supported from from customers that come back there was a, a customer that his wife got hit by a car downtown and the children, the adult children, c called browsers first to see if maybe their dad was here. We just, we have customers that come often and talk with us and, and, and are really loyal. And I know that they have choices to where they can buy books for sometimes, you know, way, way less money and cheaper and they choose to come here. And so I'm just, I'm really proud of what we're building and 
but it's because we have such great support from so many actual people. What do you think the store's impact has been? A lot of people talk about the third place. It's not work, it's not home, but it's a, a gathering place, the third place. And I feel like we're, we're, we're getting close to kind of realizing that dream where people can come in and we know our customers by name, we know what they like, they can trust our recommendations, they can order books through us, they can find interesting gifts and you know, a, an array of literary themed whatever, you know, from pens to candles to bags, you know, um, but we're, be, we're, we're becoming known for that. And um, for the most part, I think our customer service is excellent. And we will talk to you about the books that you read. And that's not something that you get in an online environment. And that's not what you get at a lot of um, chain bookstores, for example, is people that remember the last thing that you read. Oh, did you end up liking that? Well, if you like this, maybe you'll like that. Um, we really do pay attention. So my last question, which I have asked everyone else, and they've given wonderful answers. Now it's your turn. What do you think makes a good story? A good story for me is anything that takes me outside of myself and outside of my experience. I'm not necessarily, um, I don't need a plot to enjoy a book. I am a beautiful language person. And so it, a good story for me has surprising and beautiful language as well as characters that are unforgettable. And, um, and I think that's one of the main reasons why we read is to, to be taken outside of our own circumstances and to learn something more about the world and other people and, and how there are so many different ways of, of doing everything. And, and, I think that's what keeps us reading, keeps us interested, and keeps us alive in lots of ways is just to be able to experience other stories. And so that's a good story for me. Well, thank you for having us in your beautiful store. I love this place so much and it's been great to talk to you. It's been so fun to talk to you too. Browsers is located at 107 Capital Way North in Olympia, Washington, and they're open every day of the week. Of course, Browsers isn't the only indie bookshop in the Pacific Northwest. It's not even the only indie bookshop in Olympia. So here's your homework. Support your local indie bookstore. Go to the events they're hosting. Meet other writers and book people. Buy the books you like. Independent bookstores are just, well, I'll let Laura Stanfield tell you. Independent bookstores are sacred places. They're homes of ideas, they're homes for conversation. They are sanctuaries in times like this for people who just want to get together with other people. Throughout putting Wordsmiths together, it's really sunk in for me on how much of an impact writers can have on their communities. It might look like supporting each other on open mic nights or dialogue between the shelves or keeping spaces for literature like bookstores and libraries thriving. Writers are not powerless in the face of adversity. And it's through writing that new ideas can take shape and how they can quickly spread throughout the world. So, my fellow wordsmiths, I encourage you to use what you've got. If you're feeling hopeless, if you want to help make a change in this world, put a pen to paper. The worst that could happen is a need to revise. Wordsmiths is sponsored by Oli Arts, 
and is part of the Main Street Writers' Movement. Check out our sponsor at oleyarts.org and learn more about the movement at forestavenuepress.com slash mainstreetwritersmovement. Did you like the music? I did too! Tunes for this episode were provided by local musician Christian Carpenter, also known as the artist Food Nipple. He also collaborated with Christian David Chinchilla and used samples provided by Harrison Hannon. Um, Their links are going to be provided in the description. If you want to perhaps take another listen to the amazing soundtrack of this episode, you can check out Christian Carpenter's Bandcamp. Also, please, please, please uh, check out everybody that was interviewed for the Sportsmith Project. I love them all dearly. So that would be Jackie, Josh, Laura, and Andrea, um, Creative Colloquy, Forest Avenue Press, and Browser's Books. They're all just super great. Support them and people and organizations like them. And yeah that was pretty much the whole point of this project so hopefully you're doing that (laughs) now time for the plug i hate you can follow me and my creative endeavors at facebook.com slash wally drag or youtube.com slash lazy eyes inc okay bye